Hey church family, my name is Taylor Braswell. I'm one of the pastors here and we're so excited you've joined us online today to worship and hear from God's word. We've loved hearing from you and want to continue to know how we can come alongside you and pray for you so that you can take your next step in the life of our church. If you'd love to know what your next step is or you'd love to tell us how we can pray for you, please send us an email at pray at fbcfm.com. Today, Pastor Jeff Bedwell will be continuing in his sermon series called Drawing Near to God. We pray today's message grows your affections for Christ. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadows of my soul The work is finished The end is written Jesus Christ, my living hope Who could imagine so great a mercy What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me. Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living God. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. This salvation.
Glad you're here today as we're gathering for worship, and whether you find yourself online or on campus, we're glad that you're here. You know, Wednesday of this past week, I, I met in the morning with uh, some pastors in the Fort Mill area, and we were uh, praying together. We had already predetermined that, had it on the calendar for a while, and I gave them a book. Uh, the name of that book, uh, just it was a gift to them. I gave them a book, and the gift was Praying in a Crisis praying in a crisis and how little did we know that within a few hours after that uh, we would be seeing the scenes coming from Washington DC that we saw this week and we had already planned to, to spend a little of our prayer time on Sunday morning to pray for some of the things taking place in the life of our church, particularly the start of Awanas this week for our children at night uh, on Sunday nights, uh, the uprising weekend for our student ministry that's uh, just around the corner. But we also, it seems appropriate for us to pray. If the events of last year didn't convince us, the events of this week hopefully have that we desperately need a movement of God in our country. And it's going to happen as God's people cry out to Him in humility, in repentance, and in genuine God-seeking prayer. So before we dig into the teaching time today, would you just join me for a few moments as we pray? Father, we come before You, and regardless of political uh, affiliations, there is a burden in our heart. There's concern. The direction of our country, the amount of hatred, the violence one toward another. Father, all of these things just have to be breaking your heart even as they break ours. And so, Father, we just we pray. We pray for our nation. We pray, Father, that you would turn our hearts back to you. We pray, Father, for your people, that we would be on the front end of those who humble themselves and turn and turn from our wicked ways and seek your face and cry out to you as, as we've never done in our lifetime. Father, uh, the ultimate answer is not going to be found in the, in the White House or the halls of Congress, but it's going to be found in the hearts and the lives and the minds of people across this land and across this world. And Father, our ultimate hope is not in who's in the White House, but it's who's on the throne. And so, Father, we cry out to you. Do in us whatever you need to do. Do in us as a nation whatever you need to do. Father, I pray if a virus didn't drive us to our knees, I pray, Father, that we would cry out to you. Lord, let us cry out of a holy desperation for a mighty movement of God. Lord, we cry out in hopes that you would be merciful and keep devastation away from us. Lord, in desperation, we cry out to you. Change us so that we might turn again to you, so that we might honor you in our lives, in our families, in our churches, in our communities, in our nation, in this world. Father, we cry out together. And we do that now in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining me in that. And perhaps it's no uh, accident uh, that as we're starting the new year talking about drawing near to God, that we had already put into place uh, the, the focus for today, and that is drawing near to God through prayer. You know, prayer has been described as intimacy with God that leads to the fulfillment of His purposes. It is a, it is a, a relationship, it is a relating to God in a growing, passionate, intimate way that leads to his, the fulfillment of His purposes in our lives and in the lives of those around us. And so uh, we just want to uh, begin uh, with just a reminder, a reminder of, of the gracious invitation of God. Draw near to God. And he will draw near to you. 
And it's interesting, as I've studied this, this passage, it, you look at the, the verb there. The verb is actually, it's an imperative. It's a command. It is a command for us to draw near to God. But the command comes with great encouragement that He will draw near to us. And we talked last week about drawing near through His Word, and I hope you've been joining us. If you haven't already joined in, reading through the New Testament together, to getting those uh, weekly, uh, daily devotions in your inbox. Please join us on that journey. Let's draw near to God through His Word. But our goal today is to grow, draw near to Him in prayer. And so very simply, the goal is that we would take one step, just one step, wherever you are, take one step forward in our understanding and our practice of prayer as a means of drawing closer to God. This is not about comparing you with somebody else. It's like, where am I today? And what is one step forward I can take in my understanding and my practice of prayer as a means of drawing near to God. So let's dive in. Why, why do we even pray? Why, why do we pray in the first place? Well, there's certainly multiple reasons and motivations in Scripture, but let me just uh, sum it up with, with a few statements. The first is prayer expresses the depth of my need for God. It expresses the depth of my need for God. Someone put it this way, prayer is my declaration of dependence upon God. That when I pray, I, I am reminding myself of the greatness of God and my absolute dependence on Him as my creator, as my sustainer, as my God. But the flip side of that is prayerlessness at its root is pride. It's pride. And maybe you want to push back on that and say, well, no, I, the, the reason I don't really pray as much is, is because I'm very busy or I've got a lot on my plate or, or whatever else it might be. But I, I, I want you to think that behind that is a sense of it's not really necessary. Somehow, some way, I can make it on my own without prayer being a central part of my life. Tim Keller writes about uh, his personal experience in, in growing in his recognition of his need for prayer. Let me read to you a little of his story. He said, in the second half of my adult life, I discovered prayer. I had to. In the fall of 1999, I taught a Bible study course on the Psalms. It became clear to me that I was barely scratching the surface of what the Bible commanded and promised regarding prayer. Then came the dark weeks in New York after 9-11, when the whole city sank into a kind of corporate clinical depression, even as it tried to rally. For my family, the shadow was intensified as my wife Kathy struggled with the effects of Crohn's disease. Finally, I was diagnosed with thyroid cancer. At one point during all this, my wife urged me to do something with her that we had never been able to muster the self-discipline to do regularly. She asked me to pray with her every night. Every night. She used an illustration that crystallized her feelings very well. As we remember it, she said something like this. Imagine you were diagnosed with a lethal condition that the doctor told you that you would die within hours unless you took a particular medicine, a pill, every night before going to sleep. Imagine that you were told that you could never miss it or you would die. Would you forget would you not get around to it some nights? No. It would be so crucial that you wouldn't forget. You would never miss. And she said, if we don't pray together to God, we're not going to make it because of all that we're facing. I'm certainly not. We have to pray, and we can't let it just slip our minds. Prayer expresses the depth of my need for God. 
pride will keep me from prayer. But I also pray because prayer is a way that I get to know God. Prayer is a way that I get to know God. I want to suggest to you something that maybe you haven't really thought uh, a lot about. The primary purpose of prayer is not to get something, but to know someone. Think about that. A lot of times we think about prayer and we say prayer works or it doesn't work if I get what I want. But the primary purpose of prayer is not to get something, but to get to know someone. Prayer is a a way, a means of grace that God has given to us to say this is a pathway, this is a way for you to draw near to me, to get to know me better. And when that happens, some very positive things happen in our life. We're going to look at those in just a moment. But thirdly, I would suggest we pray because prayer is a way to be used by God. It's a way for you and I to be used by God. Prayer is a way that God has given us to participate with Him in what He is doing in the world, that you and I get to join Him. Sometimes we join Him as we think. Sometimes we join Him in our labors. But one of the primary ways that God has given us to join Him in what He's doing, to participate in that, is through prayer. I don't fully understand it, but God has chosen to use and to utilize our prayers to bring about His activity, His purposes in the world. And you say, well, wait a minute, God. God is so sovereign and, and he, he, he has his purposes. He's going to fulfill them. But I want to suggest to you that God ordains not only the ends, but also the means to those ends. And one of the means that he has chosen is prayer. Augustine, centuries ago, put it this way, without God, we cannot. Without us, he will not. He has chosen to include us in His activity, in His work. And one of the ways that we participate is through prayer. Archbishop Richard Trench put it this way, Prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance. It is laying hold of His highest willingness. It's not that we have to pray to kind of wear down God. No, prayer is a gift from God to us that indicates his highest willingness, his highest willingness to know us, to to move in us, and to move through us in the world. Well, at that point, then we say, well, how? How practically do I begin to pray? In order to break that down a little bit, I just want to turn to Jesus' teaching on the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew's gospel, he gives us this this teaching of prayer. And I will give you kind of three thoughts to kind of hang our, our prayer hats on this morning. The first is to pray in secret. To pray in secret. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, And when you pray... You must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. One of the first things that Jesus talks to us about is praying in private, praying in secret. And there are some advantages of a secret place, of being alone with God in prayer. Very practically, it minimizes distractions, a minimum of distractions. When we we, we get into a private place, when we we shut down some of the visual and uh, auditory stimuli all around us, it helps us to focus. It helps us to focus on the presence of God. It helps us to be attuned to the activity of God's Spirit in us and what we're saying and what God might be impressing upon our minds. There's a minimum of distractions, but being in a secret place also encourages openness and humility. You know, when we're in front of other people, there's always a tendency to save face. 
there's always a tendency to kind of hold back. Is this a safe place? Can I be real here? Can I really be open? When we're alone in the presence of God, we know that we're in the presence of the one who knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows us inside and out. He knows every secret in our life. And we can be open. We can be honest. We can be raw. We can be real. We can come with a humility because we're not trying to impress anybody. We're coming into the presence of our Heavenly Father. And because of all that, it helps us to listen. It helps us to listen to God. Prayer is this conversation with the Father. And I haven't heard an audible voice, but there have been times in, in the Word and prayer where you've just sensed the Holy Spirit impressing a thought, impressing a truth. Maybe a person comes to mind that He wants you to reach out to. Being in that secret place helps me to listen to God. Now let me make one thing very, very clear though. This does not eliminate the need for or the power of praying with others. Jesus, people saw him pray. The, the, the New Testament church is filled with examples of people gathering to pray. Corporate prayer, praying with others is, is a powerful, catalytic way to pray. But it is not to be the only way that we pray. We are to pray in secret, but we are also to pray with others others. But there's a second thing that Jesus teaches here about praying, and that is to watch your words. Watch your words. Let's continue with his teaching in verse 7. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you Ask him. He's really taking the example of some of the religious leaders of the day who, who prayed in public to be seen, who prayed with, with all these flowery words. And he said, don't be like that. Now, please understand what he's saying. Jesus is not against spending a long time in prayer. He modeled long periods of prayer for us in his life. What he is against is against showy prayer. Showy prayer, prayer that is to impress other people, prayer that, that uses words that maybe we wouldn't even normally use thinking that somehow that'll get God's attention or impress somebody else along the way. He's not against long, even intense prayers, but he is against showy prayers. So what does it mean for you and I to watch our words? Well, let's apply that. The first thing I would just say is just be careful about cliches. You know, we, we have those phrases, and we throw them around. And have you ever thought, what, what does that ever really mean? I mean, what do you mean when you say bless? Bless them, bless the missionaries. <laughs> you know, it means a whole lot of different things. In the South, sometimes we say, well, bless her heart, right? Well, that, that maybe doesn't mean uh, what we think it's going to mean when we're talking in prayer. So what I'm just going to encourage you and even to just try to stretch myself is be careful of just using these cliches that may not really even mean a whole lot. And that kind of ties into the second application. Avoid praying on autopilot. Avoid praying on autopilot so that we just kind of say the same things in the same way at the same time over and over and over again. And we do it almost without thinking. And sometimes we can do this even with a, with a, a prayer before a meal, a blessing or uh, saying grace or whatever, whatever you call it. And I've been in some environments and I've almost cracked up uh, because it's kind of like this conversation's going and then somebody says, well, it's time to eat, let's pray. And somebody quickly mumbles out a prayer, you know, something along the lines, we thank you for this food and bless it to the nourishment of our bodies, amen. Uh, and then people like, well, I was saying, and it was almost like, uh, okay, we're doing this prayer on autopilot, but it really, it just interrupted our conversation. Right? Don't pray on autopilot. Just think about, what am I saying? So maybe to put those two together, just say what you mean and mean what you say. Think about the words you're using. Be real. Be honest. You don't have to pray in King James English. 
God understands your vernacular. He understands uh, uh, your accent. He understands your background. He understands uh, even the meaning of some of the words that you and I would use today that folks from another generation uh, wouldn't even have a clue as to maybe what those words might mean. But be real. Be real. Say what you mean and mean what you say. Let's get rid of meaningless cliches. Let's get rid of just throwing things out on autopilot. And let's be real. Let's mean what we say and say what we mean. And then Jesus teaches to keep it balanced. To keep it balanced. Familiar words here of this model prayer, the Lord's Prayer. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now let me pause there. Now, I've done a, a series uh, just in the past year or so uh, on, on all these different phrases of the Lord's Prayer. If you want to go deeper into these different phrases and what they mean and how they might apply to our prayer life, I'd encourage you, go to our website, uh, go to uh, uh, where our podcasts are and, and look those up and check those out. But I, I want to kind of simplify it a little bit for us today. When we think about keeping it balanced, you can certainly just use each of those phrases from the Lord's Prayer. But there's another way to think about it, and I hope this will be helpful to you. Just think about the, the word pray, P-R-A-Y, P-R-A-Y. And let's let each of those letters kind of stand for a, a part of our praying to help us keep it balanced. The P is for praise, for praise that I, I, I want to make sure that I just don't barge in all the time to his presence and say, here's my list, do this for me and do it now. I realize sometimes in a desperation moment, it, we just kind of help. I mean, that's appropriate. But as we think about having a balance in our life of prayer, we want to be a person of praise. We need to start by fixing our eyes, our heart, our attention, and our affections on God. It just reminds us who we're talking to. It, it lifts our gaze from the problems or the challenges of the moment to the greatness of our God. It sets the tone for all the rest of our conversation. And so we come into His presence with praise. We come into our, to His presence just fixing our eyes, our heart, our attention, our love, our affections on our God. And you can use music to do that. You can pick up the some of the words of the, the Psalms are, are different parts of Scripture that just are praising God, the, the names of God, the attributes of God, uh, just to, to praise Him and thank Him. So I can just encourage you, start with praise. But then the R is repent, is to repent. So Jesus started off His model prayer, hallowing God's name, praise. And then He came to a point where He talked about, forgive us our debts. And as we come before God, it is wise for us to pause and to ask God to show us, is there anything in my life not honoring, not pleasing to you? And this is not a morbid introspection. But it is just saying, hey, I don't, I don't want anything in my life that's less than your best. I don't want anything in my life that is going to be destructive to me and to other people. I don't want anything in my life that is going to be dishonoring to you that would keep me from fulfilling all of your purposes and plans for my life. And so I just come, and I come into His presence, and, and perhaps you might even just take up the words of the 139th Psalm. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. 
uh, that, that I come before Him. If you uh, have been following our weekly devotions this past week, uh, one of them I wrote on the difference between remorse and repentance. You might want to check that out. But I, I come and I just, I just say, God, I don't, I don't want to be clean. I want to be clean before You. And here's the good news. Repentance leads to restoration. Repentance leads to a restoration of the richness in our relationship with God. Repentance is not something to be avoided. It's something to be embraced. Uh, most of us take showers or we clean physically on a regular basis. This kind of a, a spiritual cleansing on a regular basis. I just want to turn to a full restoration of the richness of my relationship with God. So I, I praise Him. I repent. I, I turn from anything that He would bring up and show me. And then the A is for ask, to ask. And, and that is throughout Scripture, there's these invitations to, to ask, to seek, to knock, to call upon Him. And then we can ask. We can ask for specific needs in our lives and in the lives of others. And we've said it time and time again, if it's big enough for you to worry about, it's big enough to pray about. There is nothing too big to bring to God or there's nothing as his child that is too small for you to bring into his presence. And it's not only praying for ourselves, but it's, it's interceding, it's asking on behalf of others. And sometimes this is planned. That we have just our regular times of prayer, and maybe as a part of that, maybe some of you keep a list, or you just have a few folks or a few concerns that you just regularly bring before the Lord. Some folks kind of have different things. They say it's so big that okay, I kind of keep a list. Here's here's some things I focus on Monday. Here's Tuesday. Here's Wednesday. Here's Thursday. Uh, there's different ways to do it, uh, but sometimes we ask on a planned, regular basis. But sometimes it's just just spontaneous. It's in a moment. It's in a, God help me. It's, it's, it's based on maybe what's happening in real time or an opportunity to pray for somebody else in a spontaneous moment. Just a few years ago, there was a Facebook post that, that went viral because sometimes a cup of coffee is just what someone needs to make it through their day. But sometimes the people making the coffee can provide better help. It took place in Vancouver, Washington. A barista at the Dutch Brothers coffee stand noticed that one of their customers was becoming emotional upon finding out that the woman's husband had died the previous evening. The workers stopped, and they moved around and gathered around, and they prayed with her, and someone took a picture and in a moment, that, that photo went viral on Facebook. After the prayer time, the woman shook all their hands, wiped her face, and said, thank you, according to one of the baristas. I got to tell you, one, one of the things I love about even our gatherings together on campus, I love to see sometimes across the lobby or somebody who's stepped to the side and, and, and somebody just has a hand on somebody else's shoulder and they're praying for them. They're just calling out to them. They didn't particularly have that planned for that day, but it was a spontaneous moment. And there are times where we just cry out to God for ourselves or for others in planned ways, regular ways, systematic ways, but also in those spontaneous, here's a need, here's a moment, here's a person, I cry out to him. So I praise, I repent, I ask, and then the why is yield, that I yield myself to him. I say, God, I need you to direct my steps. I need you to help me to walk in your ways. Can I just even suggest to you one simple way to do this is even maybe just to think about your day. If you're praying in the morning, think about your day. Think about your schedule and just pray through your schedule. Who are you going to see today? Who, who are you going to meet with? 
What projects are you tackling? What tasks are on your list? Uh, Lord, help me to be sensitive to you today. Father, I just, I just yield it all to you. I, th this meeting, this time, this person, uh, this tough decision, and, and I yield myself, I yield my day to him. Corey Ten Boon famously asked, is prayer your steering wheel or your spare tire? Is prayer your steering wheel or your spare tire? Sometimes we treat prayer as the spare tire. You only break it out in case of emergency. But God wants prayer to be such a part of the fabric of our life that it becomes the steering wheel. That we yield our life to Him and we allow Him to direct our lives to walk in His path. Well, if those are some practical ways to begin to pray, what are some of the results of this type of praying? Well, let me just give you a few. The first is that God is glorified. God is glorified. In John's Gospel, Jesus said, Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. That God is honored as we come to Him in prayer, as we prioritize drawing near to Him as prayer, as we praise Him, as our lives are more and more attuned to Him. God is honored. God is glorified. Our R.C. Sproul put it this way, prayer, like everything else in the Christian life, is for God's glory and our benefit in that order. God is glorified, but there is also a benefit for me. And that leads to the second result of this type of praying. We change. We change. Something changes in us. Paul wrote about that in Philippians 4. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Ask. And the peace of God, this is the result, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> the circumstances may or may not immediately change, but you will change. That something happens in you. I was reading of, uh, of a story of two elders' wives several years ago, and they were actually sewing uh, on their, their husband's pants that had been worn out. Uh, different generation, most of us don't do a lot of mending of pants as we replace them, but they were sewing their pants, and as they were talking about it, uh, the first wife said, Poor John, he's so discouraged by his work with the Lord. Just the other day, he said he was considering resigning. It seems like nothing ever goes right for him. And the other wife, sewing away, replied, well, that's too bad. You know, my husband it was saying just exactly the opposite. He's been feeling so inspired lately. It seems like he's closer to the Lord than ever. And kind of this heavy silence filled the room, and they continued mending the pants. The first wife, sewing the seat of the pants. The second wife, sewing the knees of her husband's pants. Two different things happened because we change. We change when we come into the presence of God. You see, prayer is not simply getting something from God, but it's becoming the kind of person God can trust with something. So sometimes we say, well, I, I called and I crawled out to him and I asked it and this didn't happen or it hasn't happened yet. And sometimes the reason is because is I'm not ready. I'm not yet the person that God can trust that to. And as I come before prayer, I understand it's not just about getting something from God. It's about who I become, the person that God can trust with something. We change, and yes, things change. Things change that God, as we talked about earlier, He uses prayer. James uh, later encourages us in chapter 5, the prayer of a righteous person has great 
power as it is working. That there is power unleashed. There is power connected to prayer. I just want to encourage somebody today. Private prayers make a public difference. What happens in that secret place? What happens as we gather with two or three people? You may not see it immediately. You may not see it in a moment. But as you continue to cry out to God, those prayers make a powerful difference because God has ordained not only the ends, but also the means He has ordained prayer. And prayerless people cut themselves off from God's prevailing power. When you and I choose to to not make time in our life for prayer, to get so busy with other things, it's as if I am cutting myself off from the power of God, the power of God to change me and the power of God to change things around me. Billy Graham made an interesting observation years ago. He said, when the men upon whose shoulders rested the initial responsibility of Christianizing the world, came to Jesus. They came to him with one supreme request. They didn't say, Lord, teach us to preach. Lord, teach us to do miracles. They didn't even say, Lord, teach us how to be wise. But we do have in the Gospels, they said, Lord, teach us to pray. Could it be that those disciples had observed Jesus' life enough to know that there was this connection between his life of prayer and his life of power? The power of his teaching, the power of his miracles, the power of his presence, the power that flowed through him into the lives of other people. Of all the things they could have asked him to teach them, they saw something, something vitally important about the way that he prayed. R.A. Torrey said, pray for great things, expect great things, work for great things, but above all, pray. Listen, your attitude matters. Your work and your effort and your labor matters. All of that is from God. But don't forget the greatest power, the greatest way to participate in the activity of God. One of the greatest tools that God uses to draw us near to Him and to transform us is prayer. Above all all pray and so here's what I'm going to say what is it going to look like for you to take the next step in prayer because there's a gracious encouragement and an invitation that if you and I will draw near to God he will draw near to you uh, please hear me. Maybe you went back and you, you said, well, there's that pray. Praise and repent and ask and yield. And you say, oh, that, that sounds like it would take an hour. Start where you are. Start where you are. If you've got five minutes, start with five minutes. Because the goal of this message is not to compare you to somebody else. It's not to heap guilt upon you. It's to encourage you to take one step forward in your practice and understanding of prayer as a means of drawing closer to God. And so this is what I want to do today. I want us to take just less than a minute right here, right now, and to be still in His presence. And I want you just to come before Him and just say, God, what is one step forward? that I personally can take. I'm probably not going to go from from no time in prayer to 90 minutes every day in prayer. What's one step forward that I can take in my practice of prayer as a means of drawing closer to you? Let's take just a moment and allow him to impress upon our heart our next step. Would you listen to him with me now?
Father, thank you that even in these moments you are impressing upon our hearts and minds one step. And Father, the enemy will seek to discourage us. He'll try to keep us from your word and he'll try to keep us from your presence in prayer. Well, Father, I pray. I pray, Father, for your enabling grace. I pray for your guiding grace. I pray, Father, that you would call us now to take one step forward in not only our understanding, but our actual practice of prayer. We'll make adjustments along the way, but Lord, help us to start with one step forward. Father, we thank you that we can pray not because of our merit, not because of our great methods, but because of the sacrifice, the shed blood of Jesus Christ who made possible access to a holy heavenly Father in salvation and in prayer. Father, turn our hearts towards you. We ask this together now in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. We want to be here for you. If we can help you at all to take your next step in a relationship with God, please reach out to us. Go to our website. Hit that next step uh, tab right at the top. Just let us know. Hey, I want to talk to a pastor. I've got some questions about what it means to be a follower of Christ or, or maybe just a way that we can pray with you or whatever it may be. But we want to help you take one step forward is your relationship with God. Thank you for being here with us. I'm excited to see what God's going to do, how he's going to draw us to himself through his word and through prayer. Hey, we hope today's message encouraged you and strengthened your relationship with Christ. If you feel like God's working in your life, or you have any questions about the sermon you just heard or about our church, we would love to come alongside you so that we can be praying for you or pointing you to your next step in the life of our church. You can email us at pray at fbcfm.com. We want to thank you so much for your faithfulness and giving as well during this time. Your generosity continues to help make resources like this available. You can give online at fbcfm.com slash give. We would love to continue the conversation with you throughout this week on social media. Thank you so much for joining us today.